Hey, Captain Steve-O here. And I remembered I had these old fish pictures. These were old paper pictures before digital. <laughs> this one, 1979. Uh, I wanted, I made digital copies of them when I was going to college, studying towards engineering. I li we lived in Naples and my brother's ex-father-in-law was a pro bass fisherman. Excuse me, he was BASS Fisherman of the Year one year. Uh, he was sponsored by boats, motors, uh, clothing rods, reels, baits, etc. He had a regular TV show that he appeared on, so he had a camera boat that we used to use for water skiing. It was a center console with a 140 outboard. Um, he traveled to Cuba twice a year. Bass Fishing had a movie put out called Cuba Connection about bass fishing in Cuba back before and when things were different. Uh, the ex-father-in-law had a mobile home uh, that uh, he kept on Lake Okeechobee, just outside the gates at Cluiston, right on the seawall. He invited us up there, we dropped the boat in, tied it up to the seawall, uh, went out the very next morning early, fished around Pahokee, shallow water, caught about 20 bass between the three of us, average size bass. Then we went out around Grassy Island, deeper water, this was about six to eight feet of water using a rubber worm and I got this bass. We went to the nearest marina at Pahokee and the gentleman weighed it. It was <clears throat> six pounds, 15 ounces. So the guy said, we'll just call it seven pounds. Uh, and he had me hold it straight out, which I don't like. Throws off perception. It looks bigger, not really. Uh, my dad and me worked together. So me and my dad and my younger brother lived together in an apartment. And we went over for a three day weekend over to the Naples Marco Island area. I think we camped in the car van the first night and and then got a hotel room for a night or two anyway right at the goodland swing bridge uh where the good uh marco river went back out towards cape romano and stuff on on the south end uh, to the gulf of mexico you could fish off the bridge facing west and see the town of goodland all my snook fishing there was at night uh they had lights on the bridge the swing bridge was very unique uh, when a boat came through that needed to access or have the bridge open the gentleman bridge tender would walk out, lower the lower the rails to block the traffic, grab a bent pole off the side of the bridge, and put it in a hole in the center of the bridge and walk around in circles to open the bridge. And then reverse the process to close it and raise the barriers to let traffic flow through again. Very unique. We went back to Fort Lauderdale. Shortly after that, we packed up and moved to Naples. I decided to move with them. and. Uh, Started fishing for snook right away. There was a lot of uh, snook, trout, redfish, uh, flounders, mangrove snapper, and off the fishing pier and the bridges. Heck, one time I went to right on 41 in downtown near Tin City, uh, fine dining and stuff on the bridge on the river with, uh, leading into Naples Bay, right in downtown traffic and caught a five pound snook off the bridge there. Uh, I mean, there were snook fishing everywhere. One morning on the way to work I, uh, in Marco Island, I casted a, I stopped and casted on a, on a low level bridge uh, into maybe five feet of water under a bridge and I caught a five pound snook. <laughs> on my way to work, I had to keep it in the cooler all day. Uh, after that, everybody started bringing their fishing rods in and fishing on the way to work. I used to fish Naples Pier a lot. My first year after we moved there, I caught over 100 snook. They used to call me Mr. Snook. Uh, I fished Naples Pier a lot because there is a variety of fish out there. It was a free pier. They had, when the bait shop was open, you could get hand-picked shrimp, which was the biggest shrimp in the tank for 15 cents a piece. And I was a skinny little redneck looking kid then. Although I was a surfer. I was already an established surfer ripple rider in Naples uh, but I learned to surf uh, Dania Pier uh, and we used to travel up to Fort Pierce and Sebastian Inlet you know to get there by dawn and surf and then go back home anyway uh, this is the first of three nights on the Naples Pier this snook weighed 13 pounds uh, I don't know if I got there early and got live shrimp sometimes I would catch pinfish uh, I could go to some of the local bridges or catch pinfish around the pilings uh, or whatever, but I got probably got it on live bait. Uh, the next photo is the second night in a row. This is an old black and white swinger Polaroid photo. Uh, 
18 inches and over, and you could keep four then, four per person. But that was a uh, skinny redneck, redneck looking me uh, with a 912 and 14 pounds smoking about a three hour night. Uh, then I got real cocky and I was ready for the third night to kick butt. And I asked my neighbor to go along and, uh, and we had 12 pinfish in the bait bucket. We got there before dark and had to wait. So I fished around a little bit because the better fishing was at night. They, the snook would come around uh, the baits under the lights on the pier. And this was right behind the bait house on the pier when I caught this. Uh, these three nights in a row, I had a favorite light up right behind the bait house. I don't know why, because they threw the dead shrimp off there uh, for the fish or whatever. But most of these fish probably weighed more than I weighed them out. But we had a metal kitchen scale I weighed them on. And this one weighed a little over 15 pounds, and it looks bigger than a 15 pound snook. Uh, but I was a six foot tall, 168 pound, uh, so that's a pretty wide snook. Uh, that's my biggest snook to date. Um, but anyway, on the bucket li of live pinfish, I killed, drowned one, um, fishing him around. My, my partner that night was using shrimp. I think we had a dozen live shrimp too in the bait bucket, flow troll. Uh, he found one pinfish, so I threw it in, you know, chummed. I uh, took out another one, put it on my hook because it was starting to get dark, and just put the line down in the water and hung my rod on the railing just to keep it alive and to be prepared in case I saw a snook because I knew the good snook action didn't turn up until a little bit after dark when you started to see them rolling under the lights. The, my partner for the night... Um, grabbed the bait out of the bait bucket, dropped the bait bucket full of water. It snapped the little cotton rope, quarter inch cotton rope I had on it. And uh, the bucket floated away. I tried to snag it as it floated away. Um, I couldn't get it. So our 10 live pinfish floated away. And I had the one left on my rod and I got the biggest fish of three nights. I was going to slay them that night. I could keep four. So I was going to get four huge snook with that dozen pinfish. At least I had one live pinfish left. This was also off the Naples Pier. Got there, fish during the night. This is redfish. Back then I think it was 18 inches and over and no keeper bag limit. Um, I was snook fishing that night. Uh, look at this old rod. It's bent at the ferrule from so much fighting big fish. I That was a Ace Hardware uh, $29.99 combo special. Uh, I think it was a south bend reel or a shakespeare reel and a hurricane rod i liked the rod because it was a shorter butt on it uh, and had stout backbone in it for a fiberglass rod uh, i ran 17 pound test on it because i could nail snook and everything with it and it's still light enough to fish for the small flounder we got there and mangrove snappers pompano spanish mackerel whatever i would catch um a speckled a spotted sea trout uh redfish whatever anyway uh this was uh, the school of redfish that night kept swimming around the pier following the bait around and i used my tactic of throwing the bait out past the the bait and where the fish were hitting them and let it sink to the bottom and then drag it under them that's where the bigger ones hung out were underneath i kept following the school around and doing that there was a bunch of people trying to do it and there was groups of two people and they all had one per group or two per group and one of the groups uh had my ex neighbor in the group and he he him and his partner had two or three at the most and i after i caught the seventh one i sat down on the bench and i was just watching and he came up and he goes man what'd you quit for you're killing them and i said well i got seven already uh but i just didn't see catching anymore i probably could have caught three or four more this whole school they usually range when they hang together they all range the same size so the smallest one was nine and a half and the biggest ones were 11 so they were nine and a half to 11 pounds i had 75 pounds of redfish there total I weighed on a kitchen scale of course so it might have been more but i went back to my apartment i had a waterfront apartment that led out to naples bay led to the gulf 10 minutes to the gulf uh, actually very cheap to live there and my future my brother's future girlfriend lived next door she came down from the second floor I went and got her camera and I asked her if she'd take some pictures uh, which was awesome 
I didn't have a camera. So that was a nice night of redfish there. Now this was another day on the Naples Pier. I don't know if you can see that. That's a that's that same bent hurricane rod, $29.99 special or $19.99, whatever it was. I was using a 5-0 hook uh, feather parrot head bucktail. And uh, I was actually there for snook. I wanted a 20 pound, I wanted to top that 20 pound level. I'd already got the 15 pound level, but uh, there was a fishing show that came on once a week and would show your local pictures, aired them on TV. And they said that they would give a good fishing report and they said the big sea snook were running out by, you know, out off the shoreline. The sea snook would be, you know, ones that stayed out in the Gulf, uh, didn't go inside and uh, would run bigger and be nice and clean, be silver sided. Uh, so I was casting out my tactic of casting out past the bait schools. Uh, the bait would be thick in there. You can almost walk in them, thread fin herring and let it sink to the bottom and then hop it like six inch hops and it nailed it and i thought i had a good snook and it ran me around the pier i had to chase everybody you know hold their poles up take your line out whatever but when i finally got it um the gentleman that ran the bait shop came out and netted it with the the round net and he got his camera and said can i take a picture he goes you want to enter the fishing contest and I said what fishing contest and he goes well DuPont Spencer sponsoring a once a week winner of who catches the biggest fish on the pier for the weekend you're the biggest so far so this was 29 pounds and um, I said sure so he gave me a copy of the picture uh, Polaroid color Polaroid no digital then <laughs> and uh, a half hour after I caught this I netted one for a guy that was three pounds less, uh, a younger kid. And uh, so I still won. DuPont sent me a nice letter of congratulations of winning the fishing contest. They sent me a 600 yard spool of 17 pound test DuPont's clear blue strand and uh, some other you know, little items, key fob or whatever. Uh, but that was a 29 pound cobia on the Naples fishing pier. Uh, excellent catch i'm pretty proud of this. you can tell by the smile uh, this was after i moved to uh, brevard county uh, i had a little 14.9 boat here and uh my ex-girlfriend your present girlfriend at the time uh stepfather was retired military purple heart from korea uh, i was honored when he passed away to be invited to his 21 gun salute when they dumped his ashes into Lake Washington. Um, he was a wounded purple, purple Heart from Korea, had a metal plate in his head. And uh, I, I liked to take him fishing because he wasn't able to get out and maintain a boat and all that. So anyway, we went out. My little boat had a full on wraparound windshield with a full bow. Uh, it was an old 63 runabout Glassmaster, uh, 61 or 63 with a matched Evan Rudin motor uh, classic fiberglass you know 60s boat man it was electric start 40 horse uh, but it was pretty cool it was a functional boat I actually took it offshore in the Keys and caught mahi out of it when I lived down there um, nice mahi uh, and other fish but uh, 10 pound snook sorry battery went dead had to change batteries real quick this was, uh, I invited him to go out, out of Port Canaveral one morning. Heard the cobia were running out around the buoy, so I was going to, uh, I always went in the boat ramp near the bridge leading to the south port, uh, into, into NASA in there, south gate. And uh, I put the boat in there going to the bridge, and I could cast net mullet and, and mahors and whatever around uh, the pilings in there leading to the locks going into the intracoastal. Uh, then I'd head out. I stop at sun uh, at the marina out there and pick up some live shrimp. I like to go out with as many different types of live baits as I can. Uh, then as we were going out, uh, went out to the ocean. Uh, it was a little windy and a little bit of a swell, uh, but we decided I had some mullet and pinfish and whatever mahoros, so we were going to uh, troll some liveies. So we were trolling about three miles an hour, trolling live baits with two lines. 
uh, out the back and I would set up uh, zigzag the buoys back and forth and on out to the last the third buoy whatever uh, 30 feet of water and uh, and then work my way back so because things were always moving around there was a chance of triple tail around the buoys cobia uh, and as we were trolling the liveys I'd set up where I could stop for momentarily put it in neutral and cast a couple of live baits up under the buoys themselves from a close distance uh, kick it back in gear and keep trolling and stay on pattern so we zigzag back and forth between the buoys and uh, we went by this one buoy and it looked really good when we went by um, I didn't get quite set up to cast a live bait so when I did get ready I was past the buoy and I made an effort to cast as far as I could because I didn't have any weight on the shrimp uh, and when I did I was about 10 feet out 15 feet out from the buoy and I thought okay well that cast isn't going to attract anything too far out so and then just when I started to click the bail and reel it in I saw this six foot shadow coming out from under the buoy straight out towards my bait and I went oh man don't reel so I didn't reel hit the cobia came out six foot cobia came out swam straight out hit the bait and I looked down at the reel and I had this little 3000 series reel with um, 14 pound test on it. I went, oh yeah, right. Uh, this is a six foot cobia. <laughs> but when he grabbed the shrimp, he kept moving forward. He kept going straight away from the buoy. So I went, oh, hey, I yelled at the guy with me. I, I said, reel up the other two lines real quick. And he started to fumble and everything. And I, I tried to help him real quick. And when I looked down, I noticed the bale was still closed. I went, oh shit, I tried to open the bale so the, the cobia wouldn't feel the tension, but it was already too late. The rod tip started to bend. He felt the tension. I was gonna chase this cobia down with my boat. If he was kept swimming, I was gonna follow him and let him swim as far away from the buoy as he could. And then once he turned, I was gonna set the hook then and then fight him when I had room to fight him. Uh, I thought I actually had a chance, but in all the confusion, um, I didn't open the bale. He felt the pressure. The, he turned immediately, 180 degrees, went back under the buoy, and and wrapped around the buoy line, cut me off. And uh, so we zigzagged back or zigzagged back around, kept going. And I figured I'd give him 20, 30 minutes to to forget what happened, and then go back and hit that buoy. So we went back after that 20, 30 minutes set up again. I had baits ready this time. And right when I was approaching the buoy from the uh, west side, uh, this boat came running in real quick, saw me come, so he wanted to beat me to it, run in there real quick and went right up to the buoy and dropped in a lure and then backed off. And he hooked that cobia and I watched him as he backed off. I knew it was the same fish because when he backed off, he took he got it up to the boat and I was watching him and his, the friend with him in the boat, when they got it up to the boat, I heard him say something and he, and he stopped reeling and the guy, he let him free spool a little bit and the other guy ran back, grabbed another pole. The cobia had another cobia swimming with it. So he, when he brought the cobia back up, the other guy switched the pole with the lure on the tip and hooked that other cobia, the free swimmer. So then the other guy brought the, the first one in, which was a six footer, and I saw it because when he brought it up, he brought it straight up, gaffed it, brought it straight up, and it was as tall as he was. So he was, it was a six foot Kobe, the one I hooked. Then the other one was maybe only five foot, the second one that they got, but they pulled those two Kobe out from under me. Uh, and then about a half hour later, I got the consolation prize of a 26 pound Kobe, uh, which was still good eating. Uh, and uh, and I even let the other older gentleman with me reel it in a little bit because um, he really missed fishing. And uh, this one actually, as we were setting up and drifting one of the the buoys and casting baits at it, this one came up and swam around the boat. So I threw it a live shrimp and it take, took it immediately. Working second shift, I could go out in the morning and fish Lake Washington. I took my boat out two or three mornings and was doing okay. So I let my friend know and he brought his boat out with his wife and asked me we fish out of his boat so i said sure so i was working the trolling motor in the front of the boat we were in the northeast section of the lake um we were catching some keeper bass you know we were of course catching release but we were 
bass tournament style. We fished a tournament in the lake, got big bass, seven and a half pounds one day. And this was, I kept casting by this little grass bed, probably about four foot wide, five foot wide, and about uh, 18 inches high. Uh, every time I cast it over there, I'd get some nibbles. And I thought maybe it was like a little warm mouth panfish or something, just grabbing the tail or bluegill grabbing the tail and, and shaking on it uh, because I could come up empty every time. So I cast it back over there one time and I just let it sit for two or three minutes solid. And I kept felting taps, light taps, like tap, 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 tap. So I told my friend uh, in the back of the boat, I said, yeah, I got something over here messing around with it. You know, I'm just gonna hang out and see what it is. Um, and it tapped a few times and then got solid just for a split second. And I, I laid back, I didn't hesitate. And uh, as soon as I did, this thing from the right side of the grass bed jumped that grass bed, completely cleared it, uh, <laughs> which was amazing. And I saw how big it was, of course, right away. And the water was shallow. And I think I was using 12 or 14 pound test uh, on, on a um, probably a Shimano uh, Magnum Light cast and reel. Uh, and a, um, I used to like, uh, graphite casting rods i can't remember uh the brand anyway uh medium heavy and this thing worked to me over because the water was shallow he had nowhere to run except outward i mean this is the most amazing bass fight i have ever had in my life uh being a, a nine to ten pound bass and just nowhere to go except around and couldn't go down but he, I got him up to the boat, and he went under the boat, jumped on the other side, hit the side of the boat, and I had to fight him back under the boat again. Uh, but when I finally got him in, he was kind of hooked in the gill plate. So you can see I'm fairly stout. Um, I had both hands past the wrist down in his mouth, trying to gingerly take that hook out without damaging him, uh, damaging this uh, her. And... Uh, so I, this is the first day that I didn't have my digital scale with me uh, where I would weigh all the fish before I released them. Uh, but I guessed it was between nine and 10 pounds. Um, in the warehouse where I kept my boats, there was a pro bass fisherman two doors down that kept his boat in there. And uh, I showed it to him, the picture, and he says, he goes, I'll give you a, a solid nine at least. Uh, and I said, well, I, I believe more like nine to 10, you know, and put it up to that other bass picture uh here's another shot of it i think yeah there and uh when you look at that and i'm holding it right against my body you can see my elbows are collapsed i don't like to fake a shot i had them up against my shirt and then compare it with this other one that was seven pounds that i'm holding away look at the size of my hands and i was only 165 pounds there i was like 190 pounds in the other picture fatter fingers but look at the size of my fingers on this body and under the gill plates look at the size of my fingers on his body i mean, I mean he's at least 50 percent bigger and that other one was seven pounds so i'm guessing 10. i wish i would have measured him I, we had something to measure him even with a piece of string or a fishing line and tie knots in it and measure his length and girth i could have estimated look at the size of the tail on that thing but um that was my biggest bass to, uh, to date Anyway, and a big smile to match. Uh, if you watched through the video this long, like the video, subscribe please, and add a comment or a question.